Welcome to Eastgate Church. I trust you'll find this message inspiring and encouraging for you today. So I'm going to be sharing from um, uh, Jonah. It's one of those little books up there. It's one of the minor prophets, as we call them. It's anything but minor as the book of Jonah. It's a very interesting book, and I just felt to go there. I've probably been there somewhere in the past. And if I can find the book, it's that small. It gets lost in the pages there, but it's after Obadiah and, um, and before Micah. And I'm just going to probably just open that up to us this morning. Father, I just thank you, Father, for your word to us today. I thank you for your goodness and your kindness, Father. I thank you, Lord, that, Father, that you are faithful, Lord. And, Lord, you desire to speak to us. I pray, give us ears to hear and give me a mouth to speak. And, Father, Lord, may we be blessed and built up today, Lord. May something be said today, Lord, that's going to, yes, it's going to, Lord, maybe just jag us a little bit, Lord. It's going to maybe make us uncomfortable, but it will bless us as well, Lord, for your word is a sharp, double-edged sword. Let it be so today, I pray, Father. And let it, Lord God, Father, touch our hearts. Amen. And amen, praise the Lord. So if I was saying, it probably is a kind of prophetic voice. I always put this suit, suit on sometimes, and it's, it means so much to me. It probably means nothing to you. And then um, it's a three-piece suit, and there was, there was one time, and I, I just bought this, and then anyway, I won't bother with the details. But anyway, sometimes when I put it on, and so when you think that, I, I, I put it on just for that moment, and I trust we'll hear the voice of the Lord today. Glory to God. I better not say too much. I'm going to shoot myself in the foot here, aren't I? You know that? Putting too much pressure on myself. That's I'm crashing already. <laughs> Amos 3 and 7 says this. Surely the Lord does nothing without revealing his secret plans to his servants, the prophets. We know that one. God does nothing. God will always speak prophetically. God will speak and God desires to speak. And it says God will do nothing without, first of all, revealing it to his prophets. For God uses his prophets as in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. You know, God will speak through people. Yes, I know God can speak through a donkey. That encourages me greatly, I might add. And through foolish and stupid items of life. He can speak in a burning bush and, 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 and you know in an unseen voice but we know there's an angel in that burning, burning bush so God can speak to us anyway but generally God will choose to speak through his word and through his ministers glory to God therefore that's why the Bible says we should encourage them and pray for them 1 Thessalonians 5 19 to 21 says this do not quench the fat the spirit and do not despise prophecies but test everything and hold fast to what is good meaning we don't just accept everything that's coming from the mouth of anyone however eloquent or ill eloquent they might be we have to test it and make sure it lines up with this word if it doesn't line up with this word you put it straight in the paper basket amen where it should belong but it has to have that that vibrantness of the Spirit of God upon it. I like one of the verses says, do not put out the Spirit's fire. There's something about that, isn't it? You know, and it can be the case. And sometimes we can just, you know, we can be ignorant to the Word of God or we just take, we don't pay enough attention to it and we should really pay attention to it. So what I've got down here is this, so we do, we don't despise prophecies. So what is the Lord saying today by his Spirit? And that's, I mean, that's, you think that's an easy one, but it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because there's many people speaking a lot of things in many different voices today. Many people are claiming to be prophets today, not just prophets, super prophets, you know, so like, you know, and super apostles that are appearing today. And many claiming that their prophecies are thus says the Lord. Uh, I always try not to say that if I'm bringing a word. I'd like to always say, I feel the Lord is saying. It's quite a big claim to say, thus saith the Lord. And you bring one of these, you know, wonderful words. And, um, and it could be a thus saith the Lord moment. But it is, it is you know, it's, it's a big saying, isn't it? When you feel fallible, because we, we are fallible in the flesh. There's nobody infallible. There was only one who was infallible. And he's in heaven, the son of the living God who came and he was the infallible one, sinless one. And every word that came from his mouth, you could trust it. You could, you could bank on that word. Hallelujah. It's truly, truly, I tell you. And you hear that in the scriptures, we can put our, we can put our faith in God alone. Hallelujah, glory to God. But anyone else? Well, there are always going to be degrees of um, indifference. And we just have to thank God that God will raise up a lot more people. So just before I even start with Jonah, there's a little background. There was an awful lot of things taking place in Jonah's day. There was empires, there was wars, there was fighting. Israel was fighting on a couple of fronts. They were being attacked and then, you know, they were, down, they were being defeated. And then the, the, there was victories for them as well. 
There's nothing new under the sun today. We can see this as well. We can start to see there's wars all over the place. There's different empires. You've got the American Empire that took on the mantle from the British Empire, but we can look back in life. And there's always been wars. There's always been trouble. There's always been somebody who wants to be the big boy across the world and control the world. I want to tell you this. America is like an octopus. It's got massive influence all over the world. Some people believe that's coming to an end. I, t I technically believe that will be coming to an end. There is a new empire that's going to arise. It's going to be the last great empire, which is probably going to be a globalized empire. And um, that's going to be rising up where the beast or the Antichrist will take his rulership and he will take ownership of the world. But listen, it's not all going to be in his free hands. The Lord is never going to be disappearing but the Lord is the one who is controlling all things and he can only do that which God has allowed him to do. He has to get permission from the Lord. Amen. Let us not give Satan any more power than what he has. He is under the power of the living God. He always was. He always will be. Hallelujah. God is the God of this world. Let's not kid ourselves on and let's not believe a lie. God is in total control. Although sometimes you think, God, have you lost control? <laughs> Why, why is all this happening? Why this, why this, why this? Is it just me ask the questions? And it's difficult to understand God moving sometimes when all hell seems to be breaking loose, not only in your own life, but across the world. And see, all of this was going on in Jonah's day. And um, in Jonah, um, God sends him on a mission. And we're going to read a little bit about that as well. But before even Jonah is sent to go and to, to, to spring a word to Nineveh, which was the capital of the Assyrian Empire, but God had already sent Amos and Hosea to the people of Israel to bring the word of God to them. You are wicked and you're evil. You're my people. You're living a life that is a disgrace to me. And unless you get your act together, I'm going to be judging you. Do you know, God is the, the great God who judges nations. There will, be a, there will be a season and a time for all of that. But not only does he speak to Israel, but he speaks to foreign powers today. Hallelujah. And he's still speaking. I trust these foreign powers would actually hear the voice of the Lord. So just a couple of verses to open us up and then we're going to hopefully work through this whole word in time for our tea and coffee. But I know, I know you're saying like, no, just let's forget the tea and coffee. Go to the max. Keep speaking. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But it says, the word of the Lord came to um, Jonah. Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and he found a ship going to Tarshish. And so he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So what we're seeing here um, straight away, there's a man, the God's servant, and instead of going east, he goes west and says, I ain't going there, I'm going that way. God says, go there and speak, and speak the word of God to them. And Jonah says, no, I won't. I'm going that way because Jonah had a problem. But we'll find that as we move through there as well. But what I've first of all seen here and picked up, it says that wickedness has come up before me. God says, the wickedness of this great city has now come up before me. Remember when we read the scriptures in Sodom and Gomorrah and it says in the three, whatever you who wanted to discover who the three might be, was it the Lord Jesus Christ and, and, and two angels or who, who knows who it was, but see angelic beings anyway, heavenly beings. And it says now that the, the sin of this, these cities have come up before me and I've come down now to see what's going on. Can I say to encourage all of us, there's nothing, the wickedness of this world goes up before God. God is very aware of what's taking place. And I'll get to a pitch one time when God says, it's time for me to judge, it's time for me to come. I'm going to intervene. And that will be in the last great day, this world's sin is building up and building up and building up to such a point, God says, that enough is enough. That's it, it's finished, I'm coming. Just like Sodom and Gomorrah is a great picture of what's going to happen in the latter days when God's going to say, enough, that's it. I've had enough of the world's sin and God's going to come and God's going to deal with it, hallelujah. And that's the great day that you and I and all those who love the Lord Jesus Christ is longing for. Glory to God. I always say this, God has got a threshold or we could say a red line. Step over it at your peril. And God can speak and speak and speak, but there'll come a point when you've stepped over the red line, you know, you've just went a step too far. I always remember that being a wee boy, you play up, you play up, and you play up, and your dad says, you play, listen, you're going to get it. If you step out, and you ever get to that point when you, you've overstepped a mark and you say, right, that's it. That was the days when you get a good smack in the backside. <laughs> or in school, you get the belt. You can see how good I was. I get a lot of the belts. And um, there was a mark, there was a mark, don't overstep the mark. And something. I'm telling you, I'm t and 
and you get to a point, and that's like the Lord to an extent, only far greater. God will, God will warn us. God is very patient and long-suffering. Praise God for his long patience. I wouldn't be here if God wasn't long-suffering. Honestly, I would have done me in a long time ago. I would have been, I would have been done. I would have been, like, you're finished. But thank the Lord he doesn't deal with us as we would deal with us. Thank God for his patience and his, and his, and his commitment to us. Hallelujah. He knows we're flesh. He knows the weaknesses. He knows, you know, we're weak and vulnerable. But he's committed to us. Amen. That's wonderful news, isn't it? But he's committed to us. Thank the Lord. Hallelujah. You know that he's like, he's so patient. And he's, he, he, it's a long game. Um, we, we all play a short game, don't we? We want it now. We want it instantly. But it's a long game. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank God God is in it for the long haul with us. Praise the Lord. Now Nineveh is this great city, right? It's the capital city of this great empire, the Zadian Empire, which was on the rise and was becoming the dominant empire of the day. But none of it was a den of iniquity. It was all the wickedness was all rolled into one. Whenever you've got a city like that, everything goes. Perversity, evil, wickedness. See, everything that we're seeing today was probably taking place there as well. Human sacrifice, children being sacrificed to demons, all the muck and the mire. I don't need to spell out to you. Everything was happening there. And I think, you know, there's a, there's a city in, 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 in America, they call it Sin City, and it's Las Vegas. It's known as the Sin City because it says, well, the vice and everything else comes together. So there's nothing new under the sun. They say Amsterdam is the Sin City of Europe. You know, and yet Amsterdam, as other people see, it's a lovely city, but in that red light zones and all the muck and the mire that goes on there as well, everything is full blown. But listen, we could probably see unknowns. How many cities, sin cities could we call we could call out in Britain? Tons. I, would, I could say ultimately London. But what about Edinburgh or Glasgow? You know, it's, all cities now have become like sin cities now, aren't they? Everything that you see ugly about humanity, you'll find in cities. Whenever you've got people all pouring in to these small spaces, you're going to have all that rubbish coming out of us because that's what's taking place. So we can see here he's sending them to Nineveh, hallelujah. And I've got here as well, it's nothing escapes the attention of the Lord. This is a wee chatterbox, isn't she? Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Again, nothing escapes the attention of the Lord. It all rises up before him and God looks down and he sees it all and he just, it, it just like, it just it upsets his heart. But God is patient. God is patient. And we have to always remember that, brethren, he's patient. Now, the reluctant messenger is our, our Jonah. It's interesting to understand Jonah. You know, Jonah, Jonah is, 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 is a prophet. God has used him before, Second Kings. I, I can't remember. He brings the word anyway, and it's under Jeroboam II. And God says, you will, you, will, you will take land and you will prosper. And according to his word, Israel began to prosper under Jeroboam II, even though this was a wicked king. But God had already placed blessings upon Israel. Hallelujah. And we could see that. So Jonah gets the word again, and these prophets are waiting before the Lord, and then God will just suddenly say, right, I want you to rise and speak. I've got a mission for you. And because Jonah wasn't too keen on the mission, he says, is that right? I'm off. <laughs> do, you know, I, do you know the thing that encourages me? Charles, do you know the thing that encourages me is even prophets who are so many be so in tune with the voice of the Lord had have a bad day. Amen. You know, I like that as well when you see the, the disciples and you can see the humanity of the disciples, the ones who walks with Jesus, they can have bad days, amen. And, and you can see them making big mistakes and I think, well, praise God. You know, because sometimes, is it just me that's always making the mistakes? No, we can see that even with people that are very close to the Lord can have bad days, glory to God. Not that I'm justifying bad days, but I don't want to crucify myself when I'm, I'm having a bit of a bad day. Hallelujah. Bad with a small b, by the way, guys, okay? Just in case your mind start blowing, blowing up and you, you know, whatever you might think. But anyway, glory to God. Hallelujah. <clears throat> he goes the opposite way. See, God will always warn the objects of his coming wrath. I mean, God will always warn people. You know, there, there will be those warnings. The sirens start going off long before the event actually happens. You know, when you hear the sirens and you, it's like, run for cover. And how long have I got? God will always clearly spell out to you and say, listen, there's trouble coming. And, and you know, you've got, you've got enough time, not just to get to the bombshell, to say, to get in your listen, oh God, please forgive me, honestly, Lord, Father, I forgive me. Hallelujah for those moments. Thank God for them, isn't it? You just know, and you just get before God, and you say, oh, and then you just cry out to the living God, hallelujah. God will always 
let that siren go off. Warn us of his coming wrath. Glory to God. I wish this nation of Britain would hear that warning just now. I fear for Britain. I actually fear for America just now. And I could probably, I could, you could fear for the world. Where do we stop? It's not hearing. It's not hearing. It's, it's, it's death. And yet God's warnings are going out right now across the world. But let's deal with us in our own nation. The warnings of God are going out, but we're not listening. We're not listening to hear the voice of the Lord. The alarm bells are going on. Hallelujah. Glory to God. But we see this here, but here comes the man of God, though he is running away from the call of God. Running away from the call of God. And I've just got wee points here. Is there anybody here running away from the call of God? Amen. Is there anybody in this room? You know, it's dead easy to say, how could Jonah have done, how could Jonah have done a runner? You ever, I love that expression. What happened to him? Oh, he's done a runner. <laughs> but how many times maybe we've done a runner, maybe God has spoken to us, and, but we've done a runner because we didn't quite like what he was asking us to do. Listen, yeah, I've got two hands up here. I'm just talking about my life. In general, you know, I'm maybe from small things. This isn't like big things like go to Nineveh, Arthur, I'm, I'm sending you to Rome. <laughs> I'm just talking about small things though. You hear the voice of God, but we do a runner and we don't, I don't quite fancy doing that. Maybe God's asked you to do something, maybe send you on a wee mission. Maybe just we go to speak to Joe Soap just up the road or, or to address maybe a situation. But that's, that's your job, Pastor. Uh, you, you should be running about all over the place like, you know, Superman here. Listen, God can use any of us and all of us if we're open to receive that, you know, that God can give us a call and call to us and ask us, send us on a mission. And sometimes we can go the opposite way. It's great when you read the stories and it all, you say, how could this man, you know, do that? But God is not going to be, um, be undone. He sends a storm, we know, on the sea. And I'm just going to be paraphrasing it. You just need to read the book of Jonah. And Jonah, but the storm comes onto the sea now. So he jumps aboard the boat and when he's out there in the high seas, you're at the mercy of God near the high seas. I would be dead, by the way, in the high seas. I, I don't do boats. I don't do the waves very good, you know. So, you know, he was fast asleep down below. I'd be, I'd be like half dead down below. And, and, and so while the storm's taking place, what does Jonah do? Jonah goes down into the bottom of the boat and he's fast asleep like a baby. All hell's breaking loose. The boat is getting torn, turned upside down. And it's in danger now of, of sinking and their all lives are lost. And Jonah is sound asleep in the midst of a storm. I suppose that could maybe be a wee picture maybe of the church today, you know? In the midst of a storm, and I believe there's a massive storm taking place all over the world, but listen, we're on nation, and maybe we're all kind of, we're, we're asleep. We are sleeping when we should be wide awake, hallelujah. We need to be wakened up and to see, listen, there's, there's, there's a storm, there's a, we're in the midst of a storm, and we need to be awake, whereas the church, and, um, and I'm talking about on the whole, is maybe fast asleep. But God sends a storm, hallelujah and to waken them up. Interestingly enough, isn't it, it's the captain who's a pagan captain and his crew that wake up the prophet. That's, that's, that's amazing. That's the of God. It's a captain. A pagan captain of a ship wakes him up. And go, hey man, wake up for Pete's sake. We're all going to die here. Wake up. Call upon your God. We've, we're exhausted. We've been calling upon all the gods. We've run out of gods to call upon and the storm's getting worse. You rise up and you call See, your God and Jonah gets a rude awakening, isn't it? I think that's probably what the church needs today is we need a rude awakening. And then Jonah stands up and, he, and then Jonah owns up and then they says, now, they says, right, okay, who's responsible? I like it in those days, you know. Who's responsible? There's... And, then, and then they cast straws. So they cast a lot, you know. You ever, do you remember those days when you had a decision to make and you did, you did one wee short straw and then there are longer ones and, and you're off picking the straw? How many times did you get the short straw? It's your fault. <laughs> or something had to be done, get left with the shorts wrong. And so they just left that right and I says, right, okay, what's the problem? What's happening? What's going on? And Jonah had already told them that he was running away from the Lord. I want to tell you this, it's a dangerous thing to run away from God. You might think, oh, everything's fine. I want to tell you this, I'll tell you this. No, it's a bad thing because a storm will brew up in your life. And we see here, and, jo and, and then they're, they're really fearful now. And, that, you know, what are we going to do? They've got a problem. Jonah then is taking responsibility. He takes responsibility for the situation, for the, for the storm, because he knows it's God. You know, when a storm brews in your life, you know, God's got a wonderful way of catching your attention. You ever, you ever, you ever everything's going on in your life and all of a sudden, all hell breaks loose? I, I can go back to quite a few places in my life and sometimes things happen. Other times you just think, God's got my attention. <laughs> 
you know, everything's great, but I'll tell you this, see when everything starts going upside down, all of the rest of you, like, all of a sudden now, it's God, you've got my attention. <laughs> and, and then all of a sudden now, you, you know, it's like, okay, Lord, what are you saying in the midst of this? And we can see this here um, with Jonah. And now Jonah says, what, how, are we, how are we going to deal with the problem, as, as the guy says? So now they're all there, right? He says, and I love this, verse 12. And he says, right, what are we going to do? So Jonah takes responsibility. What are we going to do? Because uh, the sea was getting worse and worse. And Jonah says this, pick me up in verse 12 and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is just because of me. You know, it's, I'm the problem here, guys. God's dealing with me. You just happen to be in the same boat. <laughs> you just happen to be on the boat with me. But hey, God's in the, this, this, I'm the problem. How are we going to fix the problem? Pick me up and throw me into the sea and everything will become calm. And this is a prophet. This is a prophetic voice and it's a true voice. And of course, they're very reluctant to do that. Probably if I said that, everybody would say, ah, that's a good idea, pastor. Woof! <laughs> Off the cliff. <laughs> ah, you're right. Okay, right. You're the, right, you're the, ah, we thought you were the problem as well, pastor. That's it. Come on. Woof. We'll throw you into the den of lions, you know. And they're like, oh, goodness sake, guys, don't take it. <laughs> but anyway, these guys are good guys. They tried their best. They said, right, we'll try and row into the shore. It says, but the more they tried to row, it just, was, it just wasn't happening. So they're forced, God, please forgive us, but we're going to have to throw this man overboard. And they get hold of Jonah, and they just pick him up and woof, into the sea. Now, you fell over a boat in those days, you're instant death. And as soon as they chuck him into the sea, guess what? Peace and quiet. Hallelujah. Peace and quiet prevails. Glory to God. A great miracle happens, and they all begin to get on their knees, and they all begin to praise God, the, the God of heaven. Now, were they saved on that boat? There was a very good chance, I'll tell you this. I mean, you imagine that, that the miracle of what took place here, the boat's upside down, and all of a sudden, now everything goes quiet. It says they started offering up sacrifices to praise, oh, thank you, God, thank you, God. And they start praising the God of heaven. It's amazing what God can do, even because of the rebellion of this man, but he's getting chucked overboard. But in the midst of that, God starts to speak to these pagans. And God uses them. I'm sorry the word pagans, but anybody doesn't believe in the Lord, and, um, and that's Jonah. He's on his way. He's in, he's in the, the deep now. And as far as he's concerned, he's, he's, he's dead. But God has got other plans. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Now, ever been sometimes you just feel the sentence of death upon your life, but God turns everything around. And God's got a wonderful way of doing that. Hallelujah. Jonah now goes down into the heart of the sea. Down and down and down. I'm sure Mike could probably sing a song about the, the Jonah sinking into the sea. He knows songs about everything. Hallelujah. But now he's busy sinking into the deep of the sea. You see, God's now going to be dealing with Jonah. Hallelujah. You know, God is going to deal with us. Every one of us. God is dealing with us, all of us. And sometimes, I want to tell you this, God's dealings can be pretty severe. I don't think I would be like to be tossed into the, the depths of the sea, stormy sea. And then begin to think, I'm just sinking away there. And so there we can see that. Now he's dealing with this man. The way down, I've always got this. The way down is the way up, and the way up is the way down. See, Jonah, God, God's got to deal, going to deal with Jonah. Jo Jonah's pride, Jonah's obstinance, Jonah's disobedience. And I always say this, the way down is the way up, and the way up is the way down. Meaning this, the Bible says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and God will lift you up. When you're full of pride, God's going to put you down. But when you're humble... God will pick you up. Hallelujah. It's a good lesson to learn, my friends. Don't be, don't be full of pride and bulge yourself away up here because God's going to have to knock you all the way down there. But when you learn your lesson, he's going to pick you back up again. And we're going to see that here with this man. What is it John 12, 24 says this? Truly, truly, Jesus says, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a seed. But if it dies, it will bear much fruit. See, scripture means an awful lot to me personally. It's a little bit like John the Baptist when everybody was coming to him and saying, hey, John, hey, John, remember that man you pointed at and says, oh, hey, behold, the Lamb of God has came to the... Everybody's going to him now, John. Hey, look, nobody's... the crowds are not coming to us now. They're all going to Jesus. And John says, didn't I tell you that he is far greater than, than I? He must become greater, I must become less. I get that scripture very early on when there's a scripture to realize Jesus needs to be far greater in my life. I need, I need to die to myself. I need to allow myself to go down that he can arise within me. And that is the, the, the goal for all of us, every single one of us, that we decrease, that he can increase, because he can only increase when I'm on the decrease. Hallelujah. And the biggest problem is with the church today, the church is probably full of itself and full of its own increase that the Lord has been, subject, has been subjugated down. Hallelujah. Glory to God. 
So we can see that. But let's read the prayer. I, lo I love this prayer. It's a beautiful prayer. And it says this. Now as Jonah's gone down, God had already planned a rescue mission. I mean, now my rescue mission would have been a helicopter, you know, a big rope going down. A couple of frogmen jump into the sea, pulling you up, boof, putting me up there. But not with the Lord. The Lord has got his own um, uh, special deliverers. And in this case, it was a big fish. Now people think that this is allegorical. I believe it was them. I believe it happened in real time. A big fish came, swallowed this man and brought him salvation. And in the midst of the big fish, he's now in the belly of the big fish. Don't ask me what that looks like. I don't think it looks pretty pretty. A bit dark and smelly and, and goodness knows, but he can still breathe. And he's in the belly of the big fish. And this is where this prayer is brought before the Lord. It's a wonderful prayer. It says, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep and into the heart of the seas. The flood surrounded me, all your billows and your waves passed over me. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. For the water surrounded me, even to my soul. The deep closed around me, weeds have wrapped themselves around my head. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought me up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation of all is of the Lord. So the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah onto the dry land. That doesn't sound very good, does it? Spew them out. <laughs> Whatever that looks like. And out pops our Jonah. Whoosh. And, um, and a great, I'm sure he was very, very thankful. What a wonderful prayer. The prayer of our Jonah. Glory to God. Listen, you always say, help me, Lord. Lord, could you help me to pray like Jonah? Don't pray that prayer. I can tell you this because there'll be a big fish waiting for you someplace. <laughs> You might just think you're on a sunshine island just going out for a wee swim and before you know it, next minute you're going to find yourself in the belly of a big fish or it might be up beside the Loch Ness and who knows, a big monster there will swallow you if you believe in a Loch Ness monster and you could be taken captive for a couple of days. But I'll tell you this, your prayer, you'll come out with a fantastic prayer and I want to hear that prayer. And it was a wee bit like Glynis' prayer on Friday night. It was like, whoa, what did that? It was a powerful prayer. Glynis just offered up this prayer on Friday night. I think I likened it. I says it was like a bottle of water. You get a good shake or a bottle of juice and then you open up the corn. Well, like, whoa, what a prayer, Glynis. It was wonderful. Hallelujah. But, you know, you, so be careful. You, you want his God to make, give me some good prayers and God might have to take you some places you don't want to go. Hallelujah, because that's when you'll get those great prayers. Hallelujah. But isn't it true though? Isn't it true when you're going through a terrible, terrible time, your whole prayer life changes? Is it just me? You know, see when we're, maybe everything's fine and we can say prayers, but you ever been in a very bad, bad place in your life? Everything's going, you feel as if your life is crashing round about you and you get in your knees before God. Do you not realize how your prayer changes? All of a sudden, there's a whole new intensity. There's a whole new vibrancy. And it's like, it's like you're praying as if my life depended on it. I've been there a couple of times in my life. I've, terrible times. Te I mean, terrible times. And I want you to tell you this. I, I, just, I, just, I just know my prayer life back then was totally, you know, when, in the midst of it. When your back's against the wall, when, you, when you're just feeling like crushed beyond anything, see when you can just cry out to the Lord in prayer. Wow. Hallelujah. And thank God for those moments in my life. I won't want to get back to them, but hallelujah, if something else comes up, but glory to God. Sometimes in a negative, something positive can come out of it. You know, and you always think that, why, why am I going through all this hell? Why is all this happening? Why? And God says, just be patient. I'm working, son. I mean, you know God's working. You can bear up under it and just say, I don't know, what, I don't know why it's happening. Or maybe sometimes I do know what has happened and I've made a big mistake. Other times it just came out of thin air, blue air, whatever. And God says, but I'm working in your life. And see those moments when you can just open up your heart. I don't know, it's just like there's a whole new realm that we can enter into. And you just know that your prayers are touching heaven. Glory to God. Sustaining me. And that's when you get to a low place like this man here as well. Isn't it amazing that Lord Jesus Christ quotes Jonah? Because this is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ probably in the bowels of the earth. We won't know what that looked like when Jesus died and gave up, and gave up the ghost, if you like. And many people will say many things. 
you know, what happened, where, where did Jesus, what happened in those three days? But here's the picture of Jesus went down into the bowels of the earth, hallelujah, but he came back up victoriously. And Jesus says this in Matthew 16 and 4, it says, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. And he also departed from him. Did Jonah know when he was in the belly of the fish that Jesus was going to actually quote him? <laughs> Hallelujah. That this experience that Jesus was actually going to bring this to the Pharisees? Hey, the only sign you're going to get, give us some great glorious sign like fire from heaven, whatever. And Jesus says, the only sign I'm giving to you is the sign of Jonah. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a fish, so the Son of Man will also be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Let's not despise sometimes when bad things happen to us. All things work together for good for those who have trusted the Lord. And that's not my notes. I just found that coming out of that just now there as well. And when you know that, I want you to tell you this, it will sustain us and it will keep us in the midst of that suffering sometimes that we're going through. We don't like suffering, but actually suffering is part of living our life for the Lord Jesus Christ. We've had too much about wealth, health and prosperity, brethren. Paul says that I might share in his sufferings. I wouldn't want you to go through Paul's sufferings, beaten, battered and bruised and whipped and lashed in jail and, and, you know, cast out in the sea for over a day and a night and, you know, stoned. I mean, who would want Paul's life? I'd love to be caught up in the third heaven if that was Paul that was up there. I knew a man that was caught up into the third heaven. But I'll tell you this, what he had to suffer and endure that created the man Paul, that changed him from a soul, was immense, hallelujah. And God's got his own way for meeting all of us. How are we doing for time? Not too bad. Got another couple of points said You'll be glad to know. Hallelujah, that's not them. So now Jonah now obeys. I think you learn, you ever learn your lesson? I remember a few times my dad dealing with me, you know. Right, okay, dad, I've learned my lesson. <laughs> you know, that's, that's it. And, um, and sometimes we need a bit of discipline to learn your lesson. Because we're foolish and that see when you get away with murder, you keep getting away with murder, you'll continue just getting away with it, you know, when you're young. And then sometimes it's like, that's it, I've learned my lesson. And, and you become much more obedient. Now we see now that the Jonah now has become obedient. And it says he takes off to Nineveh. How close did the fish spit him out? Well, it was, there wasn't any natural water quite close to them unless it came up a river. <laughs> so it says, but he had to then hightail it over there. And now he's going to fulfill the commission that God has said to him. He enters Nineveh and he brings the prophetic word of the Lord. Hallelujah. And what a word. 40 days from now and Nineveh is going to be overthrown and destroyed. God's going to destroy you. And it's a massive city. So he walks around here. 40 days and God's going to destroy this place because of your wickedness. Now, did he add to that? I'm sure there was. And his job then was to walk around the city. 40 days and God, the God of heaven, is going to destroy Nineveh because you're wicked and evil and you're corrupt and your wickedness has come up to heaven and God can stand it no more. 40 days and you're going to be destroyed. Hallelujah. And there he was on his, on his mission. I wonder if he had one of those big bells. You know, but guess what? He walked around the whole city and everybody would have heard his voice. Everybody. And guess what? They, they, they believed it. So God's fame even had, was known in Nineveh. Although they worshipped all other gods. But they knew the God of Israel. And they knew that this man was a prophet. And they knew then that what he probably said was God had touched their hearts with it. And they went... God's going to destroy us. Hallelujah. And word came to the king. And guess what? They believed the word of the Lord. And they all began to cry out to God. And he says, right, okay, I'm going to proclaim a fast. And see when the king proclaims a fast, that's it. You're all fasting or else it's off your head. And so for three days, or for a couple of days anyway, they fasted, no water, no food. Even the animals had to fast. Now that's severe, isn't it? Try telling that to your cat or your dog. You're not eating. And they all put on sackcloth. It says even put sackcloth onto the animals. Now they took it seriously and it, this is what they said and the, the people said this, this was the king when he got this, they believed the Lord. I want to tell you this, I wish our nation would hear the voice of God and believe the Lord. Amen. I wish, I wish they would hear the voice of God and believe that, that who, who we're dealing with. And the king, and they said this, the decree of the king says, Listen, neither man nor beast, herd or flock taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil ways and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if man will turn and relent? Who, who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that they may not perish? 
And verse 10 says this, Then God saw their works, and they turned from their evil ways. And God relented from the disaster that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do what he intended. Some of your Bibles might say repented, which basically means relented. So I'm going to, I have to, I'm going to judge you. I'm going to deal with you. But all of a sudden, you change your reason. Oh, God, please forgive me. Lord, I'm, I made a mistake. You get on your knees, you humble yourself. Oh, Lord, please, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And all of a sudden, God was going to have to punish you. Now. And God says, okay, I relent. I won't punish you. Glory to God. I forgive you. Hallelujah. I forgive you. Glory to God. Isn't it amazing the God that we have is a forgiving God? Glory to God. Hallelujah. He relents and he doesn't destroy them. 2 Peter 3, 9 says this, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not want anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. You know, this is the God we serve. God doesn't want to just destroy all the evil people. God wants them to come to their senses and they might say, God, I'm, we're sorry, we're sinned against you. Lord, please forgive us. I think we'll find that in Ezekiel 18 as well. It says God does not take place in the death of the wicked, but rather that they would come to the place of repentance that God could ever shower his blessings upon them. Who can understand this great God that we serve? Hallelujah. That doesn't take pleasure in killing people, but rather he wants to save them and he wants to bless them. Hallelujah. He wants to bless you and he wants to bless me. Isn't that amazing? Glory to God. Just thank God for that. Now we'll get to the kind of finishing line, of course, and now we can read about this man. Um, why did he run away? Why did Jonah run away in the beginning? You know, he says, why was Jonah reluctantly to go to Nineveh? Hallelujah. Why was he reluctant to go to there? Hallelujah. Because he knew that God would forgive their sin. He knew. That's what he, that's what he says. It displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he became angry and he prayed to the Lord and says, Ah, oh Lord, was this not what I said when I was still in my own country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and a merciful God, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Hallelujah. He was naffed off. He was a bit angry with God. He says, I knew this was going to happen. Well, he didn't know that people were going to repent. But he says, I knew this because I know that you're a loving and a, and a gracious and a merciful God. We can read that in Exodus 34 when the Lord reveals himself to Moses. The gracious, the loving, the compassionate, the merciful, the gracious one. Hallelujah. That's the God we serve. Glory to God. Thank God. Or I wouldn't be here. Or you probably wouldn't be here unless, of course, you're one of those great saints. Praise the Lord. I honor you this morning. But with me, I would be gone. And a puff of smoke. But because with God was gracious and merciful, and continues to be so. He goes, I knew this was going to happen. You see, Jonah didn't want God to forgive the Ninevites because they were a wicked, they were a corrupt, they were an evil people. And he, he wanted God to, he wanted the open fire to come from heaven and burn the whole lot of them up because they deserved to be destroyed. And he knew that God would, could have forgiven them and he didn't want them to be forgiven. He wanted them to be destroyed. But God had other plans, amen. And we can just read that there as well. So now he's angry and the Lord confronts him. Is it right for you to be angry? Yes, it is. <laughs> Did you ever get there? You ever get? You ever had one of those angry moments? I'm angry. Yeah. Anger is something that affects every single one of us, brethren. I might add there. Yeah. It's so easy to get angry, and here we have he's he's mad. To use the expression, you ever heard the expression? I'm mad as hell. <laughs> Don't know how mad that is, but it sounds pretty mad to me. I'm mad as hell. You know, and it's like, so this wasn't just a wee temper tantrum. This was serious. This was a serious anger. You know, anger's a terrible thing. We can read about that. Way back in the very early, the very first murder that we ever heard about was done under anger, wasn't it? It was Cain and Abel. And Abel brings a better sacrifice than Cain before the Lord. And um, God accepts Abel's, but he doesn't, he doesn't, it doesn't say he doesn't approve of Cain's, but anyway... But it says this in verse 5 in chapter 4 there. It says, And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. It wasn't just a wee bit angry. He was raging. Raging! That his brother was, you know, commended and he wasn't. And so the Lord challenged him and says, Why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, you will be acceptable. But if you do not do well, sin slurks at your door and it desires, to, it desires you. But you should overrule it. And of course, Cain didn't listen to the Lord, did he? He, got, he? he took his moment, he took his time, and then he went and killed his brother. But why? Because he was 
angry. You know, anger, and I've wrote down here, handling anger is an important skill. Christian counsellors reported that 50% of people who come in for counselling have problems dealing with anger. Anger can be shattered communication and tear apart relationships. It ruins both the joy and the health of many. Sadly, people tend to justify their anger instead of accepting responsibility for it. Amen. And all of us suffer from that, isn't it? Everyone struggles to varying degrees with anger. It comes with living in this earthly tent called the flesh with all of its emotions and a fallen world where there is so much evil. Amen. You can easily justify your anger. But God is a way with dealing with us individually and collectively. Hallelujah. Anger is something to one degree and another, you know, it affects us. You can be doing great and all of a sudden something happens. Next minute you become a raging lunatic. <laughs> Not quite that, you know. One minute you're doing great. It's like the sun is shining. Da, da. Next minute, ah, ah, pulling your hair out and lost the plot. You know, and, um, and, it, and it's happened to one degree and another in my own life. And everything was wonderful. And to, but that was your fault. If you know I did that, I wouldn't have got angry. And um, that's what I say sometimes to Linda anyway. <laughs> it's not my fault. It's your fault. Good luck. Or the kids. And he's just thinking, why am I angry? Do you ever get that? And go, why, why am I angry? And then, we, and then it kind of simmers a little bit. You go, God, look, I'm sorry, Lord. That was not that was not that was not the greatest behavior on, on my part. But we all suffer from it. We all suffer from this thing called anger. And it can rage up within us at any moment in time when the circumstances arise itself. It's like driving, isn't it? You're driving there quite a thing. And then the next minute you lose the plot. Or you, you, you know, it's like driving is one of those areas as well that can bring out the worst in this. Anger is a terrible thing. And this now man, Jonah, is now, he is, he's fizzing at the ears. But God's going to deal with him. And I've got down here just to finish this, a plant in the worm. It's amazing how God deals with a wee plant in the worm. And um, so anyway, God now is going to forgive, is forgiven Nineveh. But even in his anger, it says, Jonah in verse 5 was out the city and he sits on the east side of the city and he made himself a shelter and he sat under the shade till he might see what's going to happen to the city. Well, maybe God will change his mind and send a fire after all. I know he's forgiven them, but hey, there's time. And so he's sitting out there and he's watching this city now, waiting for the 40th day. And it's the, the, time, the clock's ticking, tick, 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 tick. And he's waiting to see what's going to happen. But God's already forgiven them. Hallelujah. But there's John, he's out there. But he's sitting out there and he's very uncomfortable. So God causes this wee plant or a wee tree to grow up. And this wonderful shade comes upon him. Oh, you ever been in the hot sunshine? You get into some shade, you're desperate for some shade. And there he is, he's nice and he's comfortable. And then God makes this wee worm. <laughs> and a wee worm grows up of nowhere and goes into the plant and it, and it eats the plant. And the plant dies and all of a sudden the sun's beating down on him and he's so uncomfortable and now he's angry and, he, and, and, and he's, I love this verse here, and, and then he, he's, he's, so much, he's so angry that he's, he's willing to die. And then the Lord says to John, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? He says, yes, it is right for me to be angry, even to death, you know. Yes, I'm angry and I'm very angry even to the point I'm willing to die because of my great anger. And that's when God challenges him and he says this to finish but the Lord says, you have pity on a plant which you have not even laboured nor made it grow. Well, it came up at night and it perished in the night. Should I not have pity upon Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand and all the livestock in there? Should I not be concerned then? You're, you're concerned about this wee plant that you was getting some comfort. Even though you'd know, you know it was me who grew the plant and it's me taken away. He says, how much more then should I be anxious about those 120,000 people? They don't know their left hand from their right hand. Do you know, we live in a world just now. See the people out there, they don't know their left hand from their right hand. They're, they're just awash. They're, they're blind. They, they, they don't know they're doing wrong. They're, they're lost. And God is concerned for them. God is concerned for the people out there that don't know him. God doesn't want to destroy them. God wants to bring them to a place of salvation. God wants to bring them to a place where he can rescue them. and says, right, come, here I am. And, and draw them into himself. And I want to finish with that there this morning. And how we can see people. You know, how do you see them? How do I see them? And, you know, we, we've all got different degrees. I, I, I'm okay with that bunch, but see that bunch over there? I don't like them. I, I hate them. And they deserve to die. And we can look at the worst case scenarios of sin. And what I tell you, this, this place was a hotbed of sin. It was filth. It was, it was a wicked, wicked city. And I'll tell you, this, there's a lot of wicked places around us just now. But you know something? God would rather that they would turn to him that God can forgive them. The blood of Jesus is still powerful today, brothers and sisters. 
And God wants to forgive people. God doesn't want to destroy people. He wants to forgive them. He wants to set them free. He wants to embrace them and bring them into his family in the, in the eternity of the eternity. Hallelujah. And I think we need a wee reminder this morning in the life of Jonah. And I, said, I, would, I would say to you, please go home and, you know, and, um, and read of that, that little story and to see again how God sees and how I see. See, sometimes we can read through our what, tinted glasses. And um, I was going to pick up these. I'd be on with me. Papa, can I put, try these glasses on? <laughs> then he's grabbing other pairs. He was going all over the place. I said, how do we see and how does God see? See, it's that easy for us to look at them and say, oh, well, you know, they're, they're lost. To hell with them. Or do we see them how God sees them and says, God, but God's heart's breaking for them. Hallelujah. You know, if I was going to say that, I was, I was on my way to hell as well, friends. I was, I was living in that mucky world out there and I was caught up in it. But thank God that his grace and his mercy was given to me. What were, they, what were they those who do not know him? Hallelujah. Do you know where they're gone? They're gone to a lost eternity. That's what my Bible says. I know what your Bible says. Hallelujah. And we need to see them and, and maybe be filled with compassion on them. I mean, hear the Lord speaking. It might not go and speak to a city, but it might just be a wee man sitting at the side of the road or it might be somebody there or it could be somebody that we're passing. And again, we just have to get me. To me, it just rolls off my tongue. Whenever I can get an opportunity, I, you know, well, you're the pastor. You should be telling people anyway. <laughs> Hey, listen, we're all servants of God. And we, we all should be taking an opportunity to just stop somebody in their way. Now, whether I'm saying this prophetically or not, we'll say it anyway. Do you know, last night the clocks went back. What did we say? That's the, the, the darkness has begun, isn't it? You always say that, the dark nights have arrived, isn't it? The nights are fair, drawn in. I hate that word. And, and you know, it's like, you know, I've been, I've been fighting for every inch of light up the road there because I've happened to be worked really late. So much so that somebody had a phone out one time where we were trying to put a screw and it's like so now we see the nights are drawing in so we're coming into the dark season as they say when the clocks go back a time of darkness in the realm of the spirit have we, have we, have we entered into the, the dark time when, the, when it's going to get very dark the Bible says it's going to get very dark as we move into the latter days hallelujah are we in those days are we in the days now where we've come we've come to the point where the clocks it's like the nights are drawing in now darkness is, is getting darker it's getting darker. Do you know, yeah, it's amazing. I love it when the light time comes, you know, when it starts getting light, it gets light dead fast, doesn't it? But see, when it starts to get dark, it gets dark dead fast. Well, notice that tonight, it's going to get much darker. And then see, when you move towards the 21st of December and just latterly after that, it's going to get darker and darker and you're not going to get much light. The Bible says as we move into the latter days, it's going to get darker and darker and darker. And then the next light is coming. It's the son of the living God. Hallelujah. It's the S-O-N, not the S-U-N. It's going to rise in the east. It's going to be the S-O-N. It's going to come from heaven. And I can say this to you. you we've been in the darkness for too long. We don't realize how dark it is. We've been living like the frog in the water and we don't realize it's been boiling for some time. Do you realize what's taking place out there? Do you know the number of children that are being aborted? When I was coming early this morning and listening to the Radio 4, I mean, this is it. And it's like, and they were talking about this assisted suicide. And this doctor was arguing. And there was some minister on. And he was saying, well, come on, life is valuable. We can't go down that road. Oh, for goodness sake, he says, come on. People can make a decision. The rest of the world's doing it. And we're flagging up Canada. And we're flagging up some places in America. And they're doing it really, really well. We're not, we're not just jumping into the dark, he says. And many other nations are doing it. When they enter the 21st, he says, this is a good thing for us to do. Like, taking life. Helping people kill themselves. In many cases, you're actually, you're actually helping pushing somebody off a cliff. Oh, come on, what's the point of your living? Look at you, you're in a lot of pain, you're in a lot of distress, you're taking up space. Look, think of the NHS, my friends, we need to, and you know, we are demonizing people now and making them feel guilt, making them feel shame because all of a sudden, you know, they've lost their vibrance. Any mark of a, a godly nation takes care of widows and orphans and the sick. This is how that Christianity should be expressed. Hallelujah. That we should be caring for people. Now it's like, oh, come on, let's just end it. And that's them saying, this is a new caring system. Do we realize where we are? Or have we just been living in it for far too long? Do you see what's taking place here? Child have been trafficking here in Glasgow and Scotland. Young people are being abused left, right and centre. People are dying left, right and centre. Knife attacks, all kinds. Do we realise now we just, oh, well, somebody else has been stabbed in Glasgow the other night there. Oh, well. Or such and such and such and happened. And, and it's death and destruction and it's all kinds of corruption. Don't we realise it's very dark? It's very dark. 
And yet we could be sitting here like Sodom and Gomorrah, isn't it? Lot, Lot was staying just next door to Sodom and Gomorrah and it became, well, that's just the way it is. That's just the way it is. But it doesn't need to be the way it should be. We are to be a light in the darkness. So can I encourage all of us that time is running out, the nights are dry, that are drawing in, but we are the people of God. We have got the good news. Hallelujah. We've got a word of life that can change people. It changed me, and I've seen it change in many other people's lives. Hard cases have been changed and transformed. All kinds of people can be changed and transformed. And guess what? See this God that we serve? He wants people to change and transform. And you might be that vehicle. You might have that call of God in your life. God might want to send you over the street to speak to somebody. It might be in school. It might be in, well, I'm too young to share the gospel. No, you're not too young to share the gospel. Hallelujah. I don't care what age you are. You might be nine. Glory to God. You might share with another nine-year-old. Listen, all of us can share the gospel. Let's just be bold and be, let us be, let us be the, the vessels that God wants to use and say, and see when God, see when you start responding to us, God will say, oh, they responded. Oh, I'll send them on another mission. Oh, I can trust them. I'll send them on another mission. Hallelujah. And, they, you know, and glory to God. See when God uses you, it's exciting. It really is. You can just share with someone and some, before you know it and then you see somebody getting gloriously saved and you can just think, Father, I had a part to play in that. Just don't think it was you that saved them because it's God that saved them. But you're just a wee vehicle and a wee, a wee, you're just a wee part of the journey. But isn't it a wonderful journey? Glory to God. Father, we just thank you again for your word to us today, Lord. There's been much said. There's been many points brought. And Father, I'm sure, Lord God, that they've all touched one of us somewhere along the road here. Father, help us not to lose sight, Lord God, of this minor prophet, Lord, but he's actually quite a major prophet as a man, Jonah. Thank you, Father, that we can see, Lord God, that even prophets, Lord God, Father, can, Lord, Father, struggle, Lord God, with the weight and responsibility, Lord God, of the call of God upon their lives and the messages that you would ask them to bring forth. Father, can I just pray that this will be a wake-up call, not just to Jonah, Lord. I'm just seeing these guys shaking. I'm saying, wake up, man, wake up. It's a storm. Start with that. Lord, I pray today that you will wake us up by your Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord, and I include myself first and foremost. Father, give us a good shaking. Wake us up, almighty God, that, Father, we will know, Lord, that we are living in the midst of a storm and people's lives depend on that, Father, on us being fully awake. So I pray, Lord, waking us up this day, I pray, in the glorious name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for watching. If you've been challenged today, then please drop a message so that we can help support and pray for you. And also, remember to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss the next message.